Hi, welcome to Restless Minds with Timmy and Ellie, the mental health podcast with a strong dose of OCD and ADHD. Welcome to episode six. Today we're going to be interviewing James Bloodworth. Quick disclaimer before we start, everyone experiences ADHD, OCD and mental health in general differently and we only speak from our experiences which may be totally different to yours. We are not mental health professionals, we do encourage anyone who thinks they may be affected to seek professional help, advice and diagnosis. James Bloodworth is a journalist and writer from Somerset. He's the author of two books, most recently Hired, Six Months Undercover in Low Wage Britain. Diagnosed with ADHD in recent years, his brilliant article about his road to diagnosis in the Times caught our eye and even made me cry. Today we have the pleasure of interviewing him. I hope he noticed. <laughs> James, so just again, like we read, we both read your article that you wrote um, for the Times about getting diagnosed at 37, which we both thought, thought was great. Um, we kind of, Ellie had sent it to me and then we were kind of running through it and we just, um, it was just nice to see someone going through the same kind of thing. So obviously I know you diagnosed relatively later than we are, but I think we both have only kind of recently gone through our journey as well. And so it was just interesting to see someone running through as you did your experience as a child and looking back and friendships and now understanding how that kind of ADHD cap is like, can change the lens in which you view yourself and how you function in life. So thanks again for just writing that and sharing it and putting it out there. Did you, were you worried or did you find it hard kind of thinking about like putting your face on that and putting it out and kind of becoming like an advocate in a sense and speaking on that kind of topic publicly? Um, I'm not, I, I, I didn't really worry too much. I mean, I wasn't sure, um, I, I wasn't sure how many people would read it to begin with. So it was, it was something I, I kind of wrote f- for myself in, in many ways because it was, it was quite cathartic to write it. And sometimes it, it helps me to get my, my, thoughts about something in order by actually writing about it so I wasn't entirely sure what I thought about my ADHD diagnosis or um and all of that all of that stuff until I wrote it down in a way it's like I I obviously had a a bunch of kind of scattered thoughts on it very ADHD but I had a bunch of you know scattered thoughts on what I what I thought of my diagnosis but putting them down on paper into a structure and um it really got me thinking about it, which, which that was, that was quite helpful to me as well in terms of dealing with ADHD. And, um, no, I mean, I, I've got the feedback did surprise me. I mean, it's been kind of overwhelming the, the number of people who got in touch after the article. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, nice to hear from so many people who've in some ways that some, some of those people have been struggling with ADHD, which obviously isn't nice to hear, but it's been nice to hear that the articles helped them in terms of, either coming to terms with their own uh, predicament with their own ADHD, seeking a diagnosis uh, on the back of reading the article, or just it being relatable. So um, people reaching out and saying, you know, I could really relate to what you wrote. I, I could really, um, it really chimed with aspects of my own struggles with ADHD. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I suppose you saying that about kind of forgetting to reflect I think I don't know if you experience this but ADHD you're so in the moment you're so in the present that often like I feel like I forget to kind of check in with how I feel or reflect on an experience because I'm just experiencing my present overwhelming feelings so I kind of forget to think oh what do I actually think about this or how has this impacted me yeah and and kind of tying tying lots of things together so I I obviously I I kind of known ever since I was a kid as I as I write in the article that there was some issue with concentration that I had and it wasn't really related to how well I could do a task so there were aspects of education where I did really well so in college and university I I did very well but then there were other things which weren't more difficult which I'd kind of just been it's just I just find it impossible to focus concentrate and I just fall behind would have fallen behind in class so I knew there was something going on but writing it down as well after the diagnosis really helped me to put the different tie the different threads together um, of my life and look at the things that ADHD really did have a big impact on that I'd always known a bit but kind of really putting it down on paper it made it kind of brought it home to me I suppose in a way yeah but I think so my diagnosis because I never thought of the possibility of me having ADHD or even just I'd never considered at all but my psychiatrist was the one that kind of prompted me like in the, we were having a meeting and he was like you seem super distracted like if you ever do you have ADHD and I was like no of course I don't have ADHD kind of thing and then he gave me the questionnaire and I was kind of at that point forced to look at all the traits and I was like oh I have every single one of these but until that moment I never once thought 
I guess I was just oblivious and kind of living stupidly, just thinking that my brain was just how everyone else thought. So it was different for you, I guess, where you kind of always felt like you knew something was kind of off. I had no idea. I kind of just thought everyone struggled with doing simple tasks, like getting out of bed and tying the room consistently. Um, so interesting in that sense, how it differs between people and how they kind of find out. Because I have friends who, similar to you, always felt something was wrong and have kind of gone to doctors and said, hey, here's what I'm going through. And then as through that kind of process to get diagnosed, but also I know people who have just been told, like I've told a few friends recently since kind of learning, um, just like, hey, it's, it seems like you have this and this and this, like maybe you should think about it. And then through a conversation, things develop, they go and speak to a doctor and then it turns out they have ADHD as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I did, did go through periods of uh, where I would think, you know, oh, I, I've definitely got ADHD, I need to go and see someone about this. But then at the same time, I managed to kind of keep my head above water in terms of work stuff and, and complete some projects I, I thought were quite successful. Like I did a book, for example, which, you know, and when you do something like that, it's like, oh, you know, how can I have ADHD? It's, it's, or it doesn't matter. You know, I can just, uh, it's just like a personality quirk. I can just, I'm doing all right. So why even bother to investigate that? And then there were also periods where I'd go into kind of a mode of self attack where I would, I would, blame you know I, I blame my own laziness or whatever for the reason why I was struggling to concentrate you know I, I think it was just a lack of discipline um, but you know the, the older I got the more I realized that it, it really wasn't related to, to discipline and, and it, it was something something very different. You mentioned just then about how you kind of go through stages of doubt and wondering whether you actually could have ADHD and then I guess the question I want to ask was um, when you got diagnosed, did you feel like you had to kind of grieve the old self and the person you thought you were and come to terms with actually having a diagnosis that gave confirmation to all the things you thought? How was that process for you kind of going through that? Um, yeah, that? That, that does make sense. I, I mean, I did feel like that to some extent, but I didn't really mind it because it also felt like liberating to be able to... So yeah, I mean, I, I grieved the old self in some ways, but at the same time, I felt like I had... I, I, you know, there's, there's that thing, it's, it's misused nowadays, but there's the metaphor in the matrix where you take the like red pill and then, or the pill or whatever, and then you can't see, uh, you can't go back and, and see everything as it was before. It was a bit like that. So I, I once I kind of taken that ADHD pill, um, I, it, it, I was, even though I had to say goodbye to my old like life in some ways, it was an improvement because I felt like I was actually more self-aware. Yeah, I agree with you. It kind of makes everything make sense, doesn't it? It's sort of like things fall into place. And also the the old self is quite, in my experience, like a chaotic, confused self who didn't really know what was going on. And it gives you a way of explaining yourself, which I agree is is liberating as well. How did you find the, um, the process of going through a doctor and getting diagnosed? I know you mentioned in the article briefly that it was disappointing how you experienced going through the NHS, but if you don't mind just talking about it some more, and what you had difficulties with and what you, th- you think could have been better, because I've heard a few people say the same so thing. So in well. 2017, I I was, um, yeah, it was early 2017. I, I'd just finished writing uh, my book um, that, that came out, you know, 2018. I just finished writing it early 2017. And as part of the research, I worked undercover in a call centre in South Wales. And during our kind of classroom sessions during our induction, I would I noticed that it, I kind of was having deja vu of being back in school. Where, but this time, you know, we're going through very simple kind of call scripts in a call centre, uh, and I'm just completely finding finding it completely impossible to concentrate on what our kind of instructor is saying. And at the time, I was thinking, you know, this isn't this is really easy stuff. And at this point, I'd done you know a couple of degrees, I'd been through college. I'd done all right, you know, I'd, I'd managed to get some kind of education finally. And it seemed, you know, incongruent almost. Why why can't I pay attention to this stuff? It's like, and I was, then I was falling behind and it's like, this is not difficult work. And I, and I thought, you know, this, that was the point the penny really dropped. And I thought, you know, I definitely got, I'd done some reading and I was like, I, you know, I think I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. Um, so then when I got home after this, after my you know research trip for the book, when I returned home, I went to the I made an appointment to go and see my GP, um, my NHS GP, and I mentioned I you know straight away I think I have ADHD. Went through I'd, I'd made like notes and stuff of of the symptoms I was having and how this correlated to ADHD symptoms, 
And he just kind of stared at me blankly and basically didn't know um, anything about ADHD, really. Um, and I felt sort of, sort of uh, fobbed off by him. So he gave me a leaflet um, for a charity to, to, to kind of phone and contact them. Um, and I just didn't do that. I just then went home kind of disappointed and it didn't really feel like it was, uh, this was going to go anywhere. Um, and so then I, I kind of tried to ignore it again for a further, uh, almost uh, three years. No, it would have been three years. Yeah. I ignored it for another three years. Um, but, but I didn't really get anywhere with the NHS. I mean, I could have asked to see another doctor or something, but I was quite, um, dejected by, by the process and just, um, try, just thought, oh, I'll try and just ignore it some more so did you then go through a private company like psychiatry uk or somebody like that yeah so i i then during lockdown i went through the adhd center um during lockdown last year because it i'd managed to save a little bit of money from just being not going mm-hmm. out and stuff just being at home and i was looking after my grandmother last year so yeah i was i was kind of um i had time to do, to sort things out like that. So then I went through the ADHD center, made an appointment and um, yeah, there was like, I had all my school, they went, you know, went through my school reports, went through, had, you know, historical references of people who knew me my entire life. And, and then there was the psychiatric assessment and this kind of thing. But yeah, it, it was, I was pr- a pretty obvious case of ADHD. Um, and they said that to me, it was, I had all the, all the symptoms in, in, manifested in different ways it was, it was it was fairly clear that i had a adhd but the, the nhs doctor just didn't have a knowledge of the, yeah. the disorder i think that's just one of the major issues is that the kind of stereotypes of adhd still exist in the profession of sort of like a hyperactive little boy or whatever and you know even just giving you a leaflet yeah. when he you know if he didn't know enough about it he could have referred you to a specialist it's just frustrating um and hopefully through things like this, yeah. we can change some attitudes in your article, et cetera, just raising awareness. But even I think it's ridiculous that the process for someone with ADHD to, to get tested is so arduous and has so many steps. And you have to find your reports and get your parents involved and book stuff in. It's, it's, I have a lot of friends who are kind of going through the testing process now and they just, they keep forgetting to like call the GP for the next appointment or they can't find their reports or they it's have to so ask someone for something. And it's such ADHD a, you have friendly. to be really on the ball. Like if you want a diagnosis, you have to kind of like. It's like my GP, yeah. don't let me pick yeah, up ridiculous. Elvance. As in like, it's not on repeat prescription because it's a controlled drug. And they made that decision apparently as the doctor's surgery because I asked about it. And I was saying to my GP the other day, I was like, I literally have a condition that means I forget to order this repeat prescription, which I have to do via the phone because I can't do it online. And she was like, yeah, we're really sorry about that. But, you know, we've got to control it. And it's just like at every level, you feel like they're making it more difficult for you as somebody with ADHD. Yeah, no, I have the exact same thing with, with my NHS prescription. And, and sometimes like I phone, I have to phone them up basically. Yeah, the, when it gets close to me running out and say and ask them to send the prescription to the pharmacy and then they forget to do it sometimes so i'm end up going to the pharmacy two three times um and asking for it and they're like no scripts come through it's it's very frustrating and then the impact of that actually on our day-to-day life if you don't have the meds you need is huge Mm -hmm. and i feel like it's not taken as seriously as perhaps a physical disability or other disabilities and actually it is debilitating and we do need that care to be kept up especially as we're the kind of people who maybe can't manage our own care ourselves yeah i mean just just to make a final point on adhd being taken seriously um i don't think i think in some ways in some ways it's taken more seriously by the medical profession now so i think uh even even just three years later i think I may have better luck if I went to an NHS doctor mm. today than I would have three years ago when I did go, because I think there is, um, at least there's a perception of it. There's a greater understanding of ADHD and mental health generally in, in the health service. And uh, there's at least an attempt to understand it better. However, I think that in wider society, I think that the way in which I think even now, I feel like many people wouldn't take or don't take an ADHD diagnosis someone has seriously because they often pathologize their own social media use as being ADHD or th- this is something that that's quite common now that you you have this conflation of people who you know get sucked in by, by the distractions online that we all kind of get distracted by uh, to some extent and this kind of stimul- stimulus that's, that's there online and whatnot and then 
they there's pe- people who pathologize that and say, oh, well, I think I must be a bit ADHD, not really understanding what ADHD is. And then you also have commentators, very often a, conservative, a certain type of conservative commentator who will then jump on that to say that, oh, well, ADHD is just a myth yeah. that these people are just uh, addicted to Twitter or something. And I think that's uh, navigating through that as someone with ADHD, um, because it is a real disorder, it can be a bit frustrating um, and, and maybe even more so now than, than in the past. In yeah, ways. I agree with you. And, and Timmy and I have talked about this before, how like, you know, the average attention span has decreased over the past 10 years because of Twitter, Instagram, the way that they hack our dopamine. So as you mm-hmm. say, a lot of people can kind of relate to procrastinating or not being able to focus on work, but that is not the same as having a condition that actually affects all aspects of our lives. You know, when people say, oh, I did no work today no, it's a bit, and they it's, did. Yeah. When I say I did no work today, I mean, I literally did no work at all. Yeah, it's a bit like comparing someone who, you know, you everyone, we all feel lazy sometimes, but that doesn't mean we've got like ME, which is a, a, a real condition, a debilitating condition. It's it's a bit like comparing yeah, the two that's things. that's so true. And now, I mean, you've mentioned um, your book, Hired Six Months Undercover in Low, Low Wage Britain, which came out in 2018. And I wanted to ask you, because so much of your work is about um, and kind of explores working conditions etc and I just wondered do you think that subconsciously that was influenced maybe by your own relationship with work or how maybe work was was difficult and I know that you said in your article that you know coming out of school and uni you did a lot of of different jobs and kind of changed jobs frequently and I just wondered if you think that sort of subconsciously influenced your interest in work writing about work yeah when I wrote Hired which was yeah an undercover book going back into um, low wage precarious jobs it was part of the motivation for doing that was because those were the jobs I did uh, between the age of let me see 16 and 23 mm. so for, during that period of my life I left school with without any GCSEs and uh, I I, the, the, I I was worked in you know factories a petrol station I got a job as a bus driver um, did bar work glass collecting I did all, all kinds of um, jobs and I didn't really see much of a future for myself um, outside of you know those kind of low paid insecure jobs and I, I, I kind of um, I when I was 23 I went went back to college and then to university and um, and and I was always interested in writing but I never really had a idea that it could be something viable to do as work because I never had any one to relate to in my family who'd been to university or anything like that um, and so then going back, I went back in 2016 to do these undercover jobs. And it was like 10 years after I'd, um, I'd left that world and gone to university. And it was like, I never really felt like I was, I was better than, than those jobs or anything like that. It was, it was like, I was going back to write about it, to write about some of the things that went on and some of the experiences in a way that I couldn't write about it when I was, um, you know, 19, 20, 21, etc. I, I didn't have the ability to write about it then. So I went back as someone who'd had then, you know, six, seven years experience um, as a journalist um, to kind of go back and, and, and write about those things. And, and ADHD did, did affect how I saw that world because I always really struggled myself in um, regular employment, as it were. So, you know, set numbers of hours, set the same commute mm-hmm. every day or the same pr- things at work every day, the structures. Um, I always struggled in that world and, um, so ADHD probably did color my view of that, of that as being you know, quite bleak of some of those, some of those jobs, but it was yeah. bleak enough anyway. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I always kind of, those, for me, like being in those places, those jobs, I feel more at home in some ways than I feel even now, if I'm at some like literary event or something, it's, uh, I just don't, th- th- those people feel more like people in my family, people I would know at home and stuff. It's, it doesn't really leave and some, leave you in some ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I still don't feel like particularly middle class or anything. And you mentioned, I guess, you know, the things that went wrong. I guess if you could just talk to us about the things you think are hard for people with ADHD in terms of maintaining and keeping a job down. I think in some ways there's the kind of just structural issue of work in general, full-time uh, employed, full-time work as an employee in general, which can be hard with ADHD. So even the routine of a commute every day, I used to find quite hard um so so for example when i was working for like, as an employed journalist so i'm freelance now but 
for, for some years I worked as an, as an employee, um, even the commute, just the same commute every day can be, make you almost feel depressed. It's, yeah. it's weird. So, I mean, I used to feel sometimes depressed in the shower before I had to go out and do my daily commute. And it, it doesn't really make any sense. It's just doing the same. It, well, it does now, retrospectively, because there's just no stimulation. It's just the same thing. There's no like novelty to it, which um, made it made it quite hard. Um, and the work itself in journalism wasn't too bad because you're often writing about very different things like every day. You can, you can choose something new to write about. So it wasn't actually too bad, but and the structures I found hard. Like I didn't like the structure, the structured environment necessarily, even though sometimes structures can really help someone with ADHD because in some ways, when I've had structures, I feel like I've done some of my best work. So <laughs> double edged sword sometimes structure actually helps you thrive or is actually good for your mental health and routine but other times I love the freedom of working freelance and being able to choose when I work when I get into a hyper focus etc but I mean what you say yeah. is is so true about being under stimulated and that obviously leading to feeling depressed because as you said we're just not stimulated we're not getting the dopamine etc but I wondered because you know as you're talking about these repetitive low-paid jobs which are more precarious especially if you're working in like the gig economy and I know you said you worked in a care home for a while. And I was just wondering, was that quite stimulating? Did you find any of the jobs were quite stimulating or was the kind of repetitive nature of all of them sort of understimulating? Um, I mean, yeah, the care, the care home work was, I guess it was stimulating, but it was so um, difficult in a different way. So care, care work is just very hard anyway. So uh, it's, it's physically taxing, but also emotionally um tiring as well exhausting as well because you're you're dealing with you're, you're having to work quite hard for the minimum wage or very hard for the minimum wage going from home house to house um visiting very elderly people and, and completing their their daily you know tasks for them so you have to bath them feed them uh take them to the to the toilet and, and make sure they're comfortable and, and this stuff but there's also the emotional side of it because you kind of worry about these people as well because you're not always getting to spend that much time with them so sometimes it's like 15 minute care visit for example and uh then people you, you're looking after like die off and that's obviously if you've formed like a bond with them that can be care workers care workers i spoke to would be uh yeah would, would, would talk about that and how that was that was quite emotionally draining um and so you are simulated um but it's not necessarily in a positive way so it's you don't you yeah, I mean, that was almost the easiest to manage the ADHD because it's so difficult and you're doing all these different things or you're juggling all these things, but it was also stress, very stressful. So, you know, I find one thing I find with ADHD is I get very, I get overwhelmed quite easily with stuff. So if I have one thing to focus on, like one project or one task, however big the task is, it's, you know, even if it's a huge essay I have to write or something, if it's just one thing, then... I can kind of thrive and, and really do like my, my best at work. But if I start to get, if I have to juggle a few things like multitask, it's not like I can't multitask. It just, I find it very, I get a lot of anxiety about, about having to, I, I just get overwhelmed by it in a way. Um, that, that's some, a big issue for me with, with some, when I had full-time jobs. So, so a journalism job I had, I remember you, you used to have to juggle about five, six different things, different tasks, different stories. And I'd walk around in like a constant state of anxiety, even though I tend, I did tend to do all right. I did all right in that job. And I, I did tend to complete my tasks. It was just the sheer fact of having to juggle these things all at once simultaneously. I find very, very stressful and anxiety inducing. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really good point if you're someone that's relatively high functioning or can manage to get things done, that doesn't take away from the anxiety you feel getting all that stuff done. I remember at uni, and I think you spoke about this again in your article, going from school where you had, <clears throat> sorry, where you had structure, then going to uni where it was completely structure free and you could wake up whatever time you want and there were lectures at different times or whatever. And also having essays and works in the background. I remember just thinking like, where the hell do I start and how do I even get through this? And then even with work now, it's taken me a while to kind of, figure out myself how to kind of get through it but having big projects that overlap and tasks to do that are smaller in the background it can feel very stressful trying to figure out in my head how to get through that and do that but I've got for me personally now it's just I make sure that I used to refuse to do this for years but now I just 
I write everything down on a list and I try and keep it up to date as I go through stuff and tick things off so I can actually rigidly remember what I need to do because I would forget I would forget to do like big things for projects or I'd miss deadlines and stuff because I just didn't have it written down so I wonder how you now as a freelancer as well what things you have in place to help you make sure you don't forget to write articles and miss deadlines and how you kind of structure your day and make sure you yeah, get that's something I've worked on structuring my day is something I've worked on a lot in the last six months since the diagnosis for well, more than six months almost a year now since the diagnosis so I keep you know I keep I have a lot of, if I look at my desk now it's it's covered in uh, I, there's like a, a pile of post-it notes in front of me um, <laughs> I should throw some of those away but it's like every day in the morning I'll do have my to-do list and I'll do one at night as well um, for the next day and I tick off things as I go and it's like I basically carry on working until I've done everything on the list and cross it off with my red pen um, and keep you know keep filling out my google calendar you know mm. religiously um, I just have to keep a note of yeah. everything because uh, otherwise I miss miss stuff turn up late forget stuff um, file late but it's, it's it's working okay and sometimes I'll set timers as well with work i'm all right with deadlines so i have to file a column every tuesday at 11 a.m and uh the fear of the deadline tends to get make me do it um yeah pressure so it's stress it's, I'm, I'm not too bad with deadlines sometimes i shoot over the uh deadline a little bit but but i'm not too bad with that stuff now but it's there's a lot goes on behind the scenes basically to to keep that stuff in check i i make sure i go to bed you know, eight hours before I have to get up, I eat a good diet. I go to the gym every day. Um, I take like a bunch of vitamins and supplements. Like I'm pretty, there's a lot goes on kind of behind the scenes. If you like, yeah, in terms of planning and stuff. Oh, you're way, you're way ahead of me in terms of, <laughs> I don't take vitamins. I sleep at different times every night. I shower, don't shower. You know, I don't go to the gym. I eat absolute crap. I, the other day I had three deliveries in, in one day. So I had Chinese, uh, and then my housemate came back and he was hungry. So I ordered some food for both of us. And then at like 1 a.m. I was like, I'm going to get a cookie dough. So I'm, you're doing well. And please teach me how to do it. Yeah, I mean, food, junk food kills my concentration. Um, if I, so, so just like last weekend, I went into the weekend, had had a fairly healthy week and was like reading and stuff, like going into the weekend. Not that I do that all weekend. I'm not that much of a nerd, but it's, I was, you know, you know, my concentration felt like sharp. And then by the end of Sunday, I was with my girlfriend, we'd eaten a bunch of chocolate cake and just like just picked that, just done nothing all weekend, just eating junk food. And then my concentration was just shot by Sunday night. I couldn't read anything. It's interesting to notice that. And that's, that's good, I suppose, to recognize. Because I agree, like what we eat can impact our focus so much. Like, especially if I feel stuck at my desk and I'm like, I'm just not focusing what's wrong. And then I look up and I think, oh, hang on, I haven't drunk any water, haven't eaten anything. And I eat a big lunch and actually then it's like magic. It's like, oh, actually, I feel like I can focus now. And it does have a huge impact. But do you find any kind of like homeopathic? Is that the right word? Like you talked about vitamins. Has there been anything else you've tried? Because like I want to try acupuncture for ADHD and all these other things. And I was wondering, have you kind of tried anything a bit alternative or sort of holistic? Um, I, I, I meditate. So mm -hmm. so I, I, get, I, I haven't the last few days, but I do once I form the habit of it. So I, I'll do it for months on end and then uh, I really need to make sure I do that every day because I find that that helps quite a lot just because it, it for me anyway it, it gives me that um understanding of what being present means mm. so uh and switching off my thoughts it just it gives me a bit more power over the switch which turns my thoughts on and off if you like so because I have practiced accessing that state where I'm not thinking obsessively yeah I can access it at different times of the day if say, even if I wake up in the night with some kind of insomnia, because I'm thinking my brain's too active, the fact that I've been meditating for several months before, say, I, I understand what the state to go into to switch my thoughts off is, yeah. if that if that makes sense, no, it does. So to just stop thinking. Um, so that's helped a lot. Um, and yeah, no, so that's something I, I do to kind of work on a lot, like being present and, and turning off my thoughts and not letting not going into those kind of spirals with, of obsessive thinking where some emotion will trigger uh, certain thought patterns and then I'll start overthinking things and I try and cut those off before they begin. And that's meditation has helped a lot with that. Mm -hmm. And other things, I mean, I used to go to th things like uh, 
uh, the cold plunge, uh, you know, the spa cold plunge mm. things where you go in the sauna and then jump in the freezing cold uh, water. Because I just find things like that that shock you a bit, switch off my thoughts 100%. a bit more. Uh, when I finished, I just feel much more present and this, this clarity. So things like that and general health stuff like running weights and trying to eat as much green material as possible. And you mentioned um, before we started that you, you've been going to the gym more consistently in the last few weeks or months. Um, do you notice a difference in your state when you're exercising regularly? Does that help you get to sleep? Do you feel like your thoughts can kind of tie down by the end of the day? Like, what do you think that's done for you being consistent with the gym? Yeah, I mean, it's, I find well. it helps a lot because because writing is um, obviously in the house a lot at, at my desk. So doing something very different from being sat at a desk writing and going to a very different environment out, outside um, outside the house where there's you know lots of other people, whereas writing is quite solitary. And it's I, like even if I do nothing nothing else in a day, if I go to the gym and then I, I feel like at least I've made progress in one area and I'm, I'm keeping my health kind of on track. And and yeah, I, I do feel like exercise does make me feel more present as well. So again, when I'm doing, when I'm exercising, I'm not really thinking so much. I'm just uh, in more of a Zen state. Yeah. Just like say when I'm in a flow state with writing or, 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 or anything else, like I used to do sculpture with clay and stuff and I used to get in the same kind of present um, flow state then where you get that hyper focus and switch off some of the it's quite liberating and you then feel free for a while yeah I love what you said about um, clarity through sort of movement because I feel exactly the same like I go swimming once a week now in this reservoir just that freezing cold shock and obviously there's so many articles now out there about the power of you know cold water therapy for depression etc and I agree with you if you do something kind of extreme like even if I just do a slightly intense bit of yoga that means I'm sweating it does take you out of your head doesn't it because you're you're having to focus yeah. or just be so grounded in your body on that strength and actually I'm very anti-exercise as a person but I found doing more movement this year has been a real <laughs> game changer so I completely agree and just yeah. going back to what you said about when you have multiple things on the go it's it's really overwhelming and I agree with you because I don't know if you get this but I feel like if I need if I've got one thing to work on like my actual job if I also know I have to do a wash I need to eat lunch in an hour maybe I'm meeting someone later in the day that all seems like overwhelming kind of satellites around me and I feel like I almost can't allow myself to relax into a flow state because I'm conscious if I get into a hyper focus or a yeah. flow state I'm almost scared I'm gonna forget everything else mm -hmm. and do you find that you ever experience that or, or how do you sort of deal with almost allowing yourself to get into the work do you set times or do you just do it when you feel like you can no I, I totally totally relate to that so that's something an issue I have as well so even if I do have a lot of time um, available so so say I have like three four up three is a bit short but say four or five hours to sit down and work on say a book or something mm -hmm. um, if I have something coming up after that even though it seems like a while a while away sometimes it I, and I find it hard to sit down and get into that state of concentration and flow, get into the, access that flow state, as it's called, mm. where I'm just focusing on one thing because I'm, again, I'm worried about these things coming up later and whether I'm going to forget them. But I find keeping lists and setting alarms and stuff has helped a lot with that because then it takes the pressure to remember off of me yeah. and puts it onto my phone, <laughs> puts it onto my iPhone. Um, but yeah, set, like setting up alarms and things like that has helped because then I can, then I, I, and I've got better at telling myself, you know, oh, I can just forget about this thing because it's something that's going to remind me that I've got this later, um, mm. or whatever. So yeah, alarms, notes, all this kind of stuff, reminders, um, has been key to allowing me to kind of immerse myself in some of the bigger projects. Cause otherwise you do get caught up in like the weeds. So that like, you get caught up in dealing with kind of small tasks and not really focusing on the big projects that, that move us forward. That's so true. Yeah. So you've mentioned, I guess, being overwhelmed with tasks, being stressed, dealing with hyper-focus and zoning in, zoning in on what you're doing at the time and not dealing with anything else. How does that blend with you in your relationship? I know you mentioned you have a girlfriend. How have you dealt with kind of rejection sensitivity and irritability and just all that kind of ADHD stuff that comes and how have you managed to scope your life to be close to someone? Any issues you had with that? Any um, advice you have as well? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult one because I suppose in a way it's something I'm still still working on because, I mean, I, I have a girlfriend now and it's been 
almost three months we've been yes it's no it's three months i think we've been uh dating now and it's, it's you know it's, it's going really well and she knows obviously about my adhd she, i've read the article <laughs> um but it's i mean i did go through periods where so 2019 spe- specifically where i was like very promiscuous so i was in i was living in las vegas for three months so what i mean what what do you expect mm. but <laughs> yeah i've seen but, the films. but it was there is that kind of yeah and i, I used to think oh that's this is just because i'm i'm like I'm a, I'm a guy so it's just like normal um and i like i i, I finished mm. relationships because i i kind of missed the novelty of, of meeting new people um that was at least part of it so like i don't regret ever ending any relationships maybe one <laughs> maybe maybe yeah maybe maybe one or two but because I think it was then it was just like I had a desire for novelty, which maybe was an ADHD thing. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, I think I'm quite fun to be around because I have <laughs> because I'm an ADHD person. So I I've never really had any girl or any woman I've dated has been particularly bored hanging out with me or anything <laughs> because we're always doing some fun stuff. Uh, so there's it's, there's pros and cons, I think. And but at the moment, yeah. I understand now that the kind of desire for novelty is partly an ADHD thing. And uh, just because you have a certain impulse does not mean you should, uh, yeah. you should just give into it or you should, the, the, it doesn't mean that that's where the value lies. Yeah, There, there can be a greater value than just following the, your impulses. There, there can be something bigger than that. I understand that better now. That's a, that's a really powerful point. And I love that because I agree. I think in the past, like at the beginning of a relationship, I like hyper-focus on that person. And I want to spend all my time with them and they're like my source of dopamine. And then the more you kind of spend time with them and, you know, months go by, you do get a bit bored and the novelty wears off. And I agree with you. Before I knew I had ADHD, I would, and also I have OCD. So I'd sort of have these like relationship intrusive thoughts of like, oh, are they wrong for me? Are they boring? And, you know, we're told by society all mm-hmm. the time, like go with your gut feeling, like you know what's right for you, you know, and actually as you you say like yeah. when you have ADHD your <laughs> yeah your impulses aren't it's necessarily right. what's good for you or what's going to make you happy and actually as you say like investing in a relationship and maybe realizing okay maybe I feel bored but it's not because that person's boring it's because I have a need for novelty how can I get that in other ways how can I deepen my relationship and not just kind of run yeah. away and I think that's so interesting and do you feel frustrated that You've kind of, I mean, I suppose you were saying earlier that you, you know, the diagnosis was great, but you things about work, it doesn't seem like it maybe negatively impacted you that much. But do you feel like realizing this now, is it frustrating looking back on your younger self? Do you feel like you wish you'd sort of known that earlier in terms of relationships? Um, I'm not sure because, I mean, it's, it's in a way, like a lot of these things, it's like too early to tell mm. because it, it depends how things turn out ultimately, then I can look back and say, oh, you know, it was all for the best. Yeah. But you, do, you can only do that retrospectively. So it's, it's like, I don't know yet. Um, in some ways, in some ways, the ADHD wasn't, um, in some ways, like being, like impulsively leaving someone, I suppose, <laughs> like, to, put, to put it that yeah. way. It, it wasn't always bad because I didn't then, I, I do know other people, uh, like neurotypical people who, end up stuck in relationships <laughs> yeah. they don't really want to be in. Yeah. Um, very, and very they seem quite miserable as well. <laughs> um, yeah, they often seem quite miserable as well. So I never had to go, I never find myself stuck so much in that position mm. um, because I, the leverage to 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 quit was was always accessible, Yeah, basically, um, and, and was there. So, I mean, I'm not sure. There's, there's There are times I've done stupid things where I think, yeah, that was just a... a you know where it's made someone else feel bad Mm -hmm. and I wish I hadn't done that because not because I regret how it's turned out for me but I just I don't want to be the person who does things like that and treat someone badly or something um yeah so yeah there's there's when I was younger yeah there's definitely I wish I had more of an awareness of where some of that impulsiveness comes from because the awareness is the first step in kind of reining it in yeah because once you have an awareness of something arising you can kind of you have more of an ability to kind of shut it off or, or see it for what it is and just see it, acknowledge it, but then let it pass. Yeah, I think, again, just going back to what you said about impulsivity and being promiscuous at a certain stage in your life and being a bit wild when you're younger, I think there's a lot of research that shows there's high cases of sex addiction with ADHD or drug abuse or cigarette smoking or 
yeah. addiction to sugar because obviously as you said before there's the, the need for novelty and constant stimulation you kind of think okay if i just do loads of this and i keep jumping around and finding things that are exciting and especially when you find yeah. something like for me it's sweets like i have sugar and i'm like, oh my brain's on like yeah i feel like i'm like actually about or like i've seen people go through like smoking continuously or sex or drugs and i guess as you said, it's that need to kind of stimulate yourself. But I guess when you were younger, I was going to ask, did you find yourself misbehaving or being in trouble all the time or experimenting with other stuff that you shouldn't have been because you just needed, had that need to, I guess, yeah, be stimulated? I wasn't, as a, as a uh, teenager, I, I wasn't like super bad. Like I wasn't, wasn't in heaps of trouble. You know, I, I got, got arrested once. Um, um, I think it was, I think it was once. Uh, uh, then I was like 19. I think it was 19 yeah um got mm-hmm. in a bit of trouble I, w- I was very like naughty but in more in like as a, as a kid but it was more like mischief not yeah like, not like genuinely bad mm, yeah not yeah. like nasty kind of yeah. addictive I know exactly what you mean I think with ADHD it's like we don't want to be bad we don't want to hurt other people but we just want a bit of excitement kind of thing yeah it was, it was I was just to say it's more it was more like I was uh you know like Dennis the Menace <laughs> rather than I don't know, some mm. like teenage, like, I don't know. Rebel without a cause. I wasn't, I wasn't that much of a troublemaker, yeah. Tasmanian devil. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, as you were saying before, that ADHD people are relatively fun to be around because we always want to do th- fun things to stay stimulated. And so I was a bit naughty at school, but I was also like a bit charming. Yeah. So I was friends with most of my teachers. So I could kind of get away with like talking a bit too much or like making a bit of a, a sassy joke back in front of the class. But then I would like, do my work and not be too bad to behave and get okay grades and so it was fine yeah. and i guess this is probably why a lot of people that are high performing or can get good grades or don't aren't hyperactive don't get diagnosed it's just like well he's getting yeah. good grades it's just a bit chatty kind of thing yeah i mean the the i was just going to go back to the point you made about food so um a big issue i i've mm. always had is like binge eating mm. as a as a coping strategy like i have a, an incredibly sweet tooth and, and you mentioned sweets but for me it would be yeah sweets would be one thing but priority would be like chocolate same and and also crisps crisps like strong flavored crisps um what's your favorite flavor of crisps uh, it, favorite flavor it, of again that, that those things change as well so like if i said my favorite is like tomorrow it'd be different um have so you seen I those like memes the, at the moment, that's like yeah. when you stock up on food that no longer tastes like dopamine and it's that joke about how ADHD yeah, people exactly. we go through phases of obsessively <laughs> eating one thing like for me um, right now it's like this particular type of spaghetti and I keep eating Nature Valley peanut bars and I will do that for about two weeks and then I'll flip to something else and I won't go back yeah yeah no exactly and for, for me at the moment it's it's the nice and spicy knickknacks like right, the big bags yep. the old school ones <laughs> that, that no. is yeah, so what it a leaves throwback. like an orange dust. <laughs> like, like, I used to love those. Orange, <laughs> orange fingers, orange teeth. Yeah. I'm sure your girlfriend yeah. loves that. Um, but, but again, I've, I've got... <laughs> the eating's mostly under control at the moment. Um, so I'm not doing that. But I, mm. I have gone through phases of... Yeah, during lockdown, for example, where I just like pig out and it's like, I have to stop or I'm going to get diabetes <laughs> or something. Does it coincide, you think, with like stress or high pressure with work or having to write? Like when you have big things to do, do you binge eat to cope or is it the other way around? How do you see it? Uh, so if I, for example, if I take my medication consecutively and then stop, it's then it comes back because I just find, my, it, find it quite hard to just exist. So I need mm. that kind of stimulation just to exist. Um, sometimes if I'm in a low emotional state, that's uh, I think that's true for everyone to some extent. You, you, you try to uh, palliate it with... with substances whether it's alcohol cigarettes or junk food I, I find that's but i think it's even a slightly low emotional state i can start thinking about going to the shop and purchasing just a load of crap um though those things things yeah. really are the or if i have to complete some particularly arduous boring task i have to find some stimulation from somewhere so i'll eat while i'm doing yeah. it yeah yeah i think alcohol as well for, for me like i've never been a drinker um it just doesn't do anything for me but during lockdown because life was so monotonous and so boring i'd finish work at 7 8 and be like i need to have something to, that makes me feel like i'm doing something exciting yeah. after work so i just started drinking like have a beer a night and then it's two beers and it's two glasses of wine and it's a, at one point in my flat we we're doing a bottle and a half of wine every night for like three months then one day we kind of <laughs> looked in the mirror in the morning before getting ready for work and we're like we both look horrible we're clearly going through like some kind of alcoholism like we need to right. get our lives a bit exactly and like red teeth but it's it's so easy to just get into that habit of like okay well this feels good and stimulates me or makes me feel like i'm 
doing something different or gets me in a kind of mood that I like and you mm. just do it habitually until one day you stop because you're saying about switching foods and stuff very dangerous there was one Easter where like this was just before I was diagnosed and I was working in an office and what I do every day is like you know when mini eggs come out just before Easter I got into a habit of buying like three of the big packets a day and just eating them because to me I was like when I have an energy dip oh I need a packet of any mini eggs which now I take Elvance but my boyfriend yeah. at the time was like this isn't normal like are you okay and I think <laughs> like we don't realize it but yeah self-medicating again with really sugary foods because they do help you focus obviously for a short period of time they are delicious they are delicious yeah. and also as you said James like that idea in your head mm. of oh, I feel shit I feel yeah. unstimulated I feel tired do you know what I'm gonna go and like go to the shop and buy some chocolate it kind of it gives me a sort of thrill I don't know or like a boost it makes me suddenly yeah. feel happier it's like <laughs> a treat all right after exactly all. yeah but it becomes a problem when your response to that I want to do something to myself is buying a tv or like now I'm, I'm buying a cat Probably this week out of the blue that. because my friend just sent me a picture of a cat and it's 500 pounds and I just I and then I go on holiday like in the, like spur of the moment I've got like three holidays lined up in the next three weeks for no reason I just cannot say no and it's funny because also like the cat will be cute and like whatever but I'm also cr incredibly broke at the minute for no reason other than me being crazy but it also it shows how different our incomes are because Timmy's like oh I'm actually gonna go to Greece and buy a cat and I'm like I bought some crocs last night <laughs> and like <laughs> yeah I'm glad I don't earn too much because I would just half be buying how do you find that, James? Like, how do you find like financial management of yourself? Um, so one one issue I kind of, uh, which I didn't really realize was an issue is like when I have money in any in any way, like in my bank account, it just I I just my natural impulse is like oh, I should spend that. So I, I not to save at all. It's just like oh, this is how much I've got to spend. And, uh, and, I, and I don't really go on like sp huge sprees of, of buying stuff just impulsively so much um, because I don't really like going out shop to the shops mm. shopping. I just don't really, I find that very annoying. Um, so I don't really do that, but um, I will spend it. It will just go. I spend it on like experiences on like holidays. Mm -hmm. So the Vegas, three months in Vegas, I decided to do that like three months before, uh, three weeks before. Wow. Um, just like, oh, I'm going to just leave for like three months. And um that was like quite impulsive, uh, really. Um, and yeah, it just, the money just kind of trickles away yeah. uh, because I don't have any, I just think it's there to just buy things, just lots of little things, um, holidays, books. Um, yeah, books. Yeah, okay. like I do buy clothes online. Yeah, mm. I do have quite a big wardrobe, I suppose. I feel the same. It's like, I just have this almost resistance to saving. It's like saving is boring. I don't know. I have the same thing. Where I'm like, if it's there, it needs to be used, um, which... yeah. Yeah. If I ever see a comma in my bank statement, it's uh, yeah, I, I start to have to spend spend like go out and spend a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah, humble flex there. Uh, not, no not commas for me not yet, for but while, when I get yeah. there, <laughs> mainly furloughed as well. Uh, yeah. God, yeah. Um, mm. and then like I wanted to ask about social media. Um, and I guess you write a lot. I said, we've kind of been going through doing research on your Twitter and stuff and articles. And I guess how you found using social media with ADHD and how you kind of regulate that and also how you kind of navigate conversations online. Because I used to, I don't know if it's an ADHD thing, I used to get into a lot of, and I've seen you said this as well, and getting to be yeah. some people online. Between like the ages of like, whatever age is, sixth form, to like second year of uni, my <laughs> whole brand was like online arguments. Like I was just like posting stuff and I'd be like, how dare you say this? And I'd like find people online on Daily Mail and I'd like do the race post and I'd fight people from school. And I'd, maybe that was me trying to seek stimulation. But I wonder if you have had a similar experience with social media. Yeah, I find, agency. so I find myself using social media less because I, that was where I suppose I understood more about rejection sensitivity mm. uh, with ADHD because it's, you can easily find yourself on the receiving end of a pile on from people uh for saying the most kind of innocuous things so you can say some very you could say the same thing in, in a pub or something and people would be you know you might, people might disagree with you but no one's going to call you a piece of shit and tell you you should die uh which mm -hmm. is like oh, that is yeah. something that's kind of quite common on yeah. platforms like twitter um yeah yeah I've had, have you I've had, had that, that like a bunch of times over the last like 10 years since i've, since I've been a journalist yeah wow. you've had all sorts of stuff um yeah it's so I, like i don't use it so much i i don't really engage with people so much which is uh yeah sad in one way um because but there's so much bad faith on there that 
I'll engage with people if they, like with the ADHD stuff, I had people messaging me about that article and I try to engage and reply to all of those people because it's, it's not really political so much. It's, it's more just uh, constructive and good faith and people want information and we took, can have a conversation. But I find with people on Twitter, so obsessed with politics and when I write about it, you just get a deluge of people who their whole identity is bound up with some political allegiance and uh, disagreeing with them feels like an attack on their their entire being and then they start insulting you and just uh yeah it doesn't make me feel good being in that in that world always yeah because obviously you've just written so I was gonna say you've just written about Tony Blair and I just feel like that likely I, I mean if I was you I just turn off my dms after that's kind of come out it must be stressful um I wanted to just touch on again re- rejection sensitivity because you mentioned that with social media and I guess how that has been a a thing in your life before you were diagnosed and after because for me I as a person growing up at school I would always overextend myself and try and be the popular guy and the jester and be friends with everyone even to the point where it was detrimental to me I didn't actually like the people because I hated the idea of someone not liking me and if one person said hey like Jake said that you're a loser at school I my brain would just like explode and be like what the hell like what have I done wrong what can I do to make him like me and throughout uni and even work I think I've always the fear of being rejected or not being liked means that I overcompensate. So I'm the talkative one, I'm the friendly one, I'm the come to me with your problems one. But I wonder how you, how it affects you and how you deal with it and how you, especially with your position on social media and having followers, as you said, how you balance that. Um, that so yeah, I, I definitely can relate to that. So I, I would be, um, when I was like a kid, I'd be more of like a people pleaser. Um, I'd be like too agreeable and end up be, end up like, yeah, I mean, it's not good to be like that because because you, you kind of end up doing things you don't want to do. You end up uh, like you don't want to be too agreeable. Um, so I, that's, again, that's something I've worked on as I've, as I've grown, grown up um, to kind of understand things like boundaries, uh, mm-hmm. to understand um, when someone's like trying to take advantage of you in some way, like financially or whatever, or, or some professional context. Um, and not just, yeah, not just being agreeable, not being afraid of conflict, not being mm-hmm. afraid of, uh because because the thing is when when you do stand up for yourself it, it in many ways it often makes conflict less likely it's when you're too agreeable and someone sees you as kind of a soft target that's when uh they tend to come after you so that's that's mm. kind of a weird psychological paradox that i've just kind of thought about more and i think that applies online with uh social media as well because i think a lot of people who who really get stick online it tends to be the people who are well-intentioned who kind of pander to the zealots of whatever political faction, the the people who are, you know, they they Mm. are trying to be, to to do the right thing and they're too agreeable um, and they, they pander too much to the zealots and then they find themselves attacked. Whereas I think, unfortunately, I I say, unfortunately, the people who, who don't give a fuck, who don't care and are just like piss off, they tend to not, they tend to get less, less uh hassle than than the people who are trying to do the to do the right thing so i've tried mm-hmm. to adopt an attitude of I, I mean not not caring but um just um not kind of trying to be too agreeable and not pandering to to people just for reasons of politics or professional stuff or whatever i think it's interesting and it's hard on twitter as well just the nature of twitter like it doesn't really allow allow for nuance because obviously you've only you've got a really small character limit and it's kind of like a sound bite and people just throw things out and I guess I think it's a difficult space. Like I'm not personally on Twitter myself, even though Restless Minds is. Um, yeah, I think it just must be stressful because people are just throwing out these ideas and there's no kind of nuance at all. And you're either good or you're bad. It's very all black and white. And yeah, it yeah. just sounds stressful. Yeah. And, and people are pandering to, to their audience they've built as well. Mm. And one of the fastest ways to build an audience on Twitter is by attacking other people. Right. Um, that's so. If if I go on Twitter and start sharing like articles and stuff, yeah, yeah. If 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 it's something like the ADHD article and things like that that I've really put a lot into, they'll they'll t- they'll tend to do very well. Mm-hmm. But it's if I go on Twitter and just start arguing with people, like bigger with bigger accounts with like bigger bigger accounts, then mm-hmm. I'll uh, probably pick up more followers doing that. And you see some people just doing that, or just or just tweeting out the most sensationalist, obnoxious things just to get a reaction because then it just gets shared all over goes viral right um because people who disagree with it are kind of hate tweeting it 
and yeah. that's how you pick up followers basically so the whole platform is geared towards that okay i see like basically being one extreme as well i guess just like the more kind of yeah i mean stream your opinion saying extreme stuff gets you to go viral yeah. on it, and that gives you clout all the all the people i know on twitter that are, have come up in the last year even during lockdown well most of them at least should i say that have gained followings have a very strong view on a certain thing that they talk about controversially all the time so if it's about men it's like we hate men and men are this and this and that and whatever and that becomes their brand and then because it's controversial they have arguments online and it, it blows up or if it's race or whatever people have with twitter specifically being a problem starter people like entertainment and it's very unhealthy but people will follow those pages or share it or retweet it and obviously the algorithm is like this is getting a lot of interaction so it goes viral so they get more followers and they get placed on the page more so it's all very yeah, and there's also very like insidious. audience capture after that yeah that, that's a, that was a good point I think the audience capture as well. So they have this brand and then the audience expects a certain thing from the brand. So if they deviate from it, the audience like gives them a lot of crap. And so they think, oh, I better not you know, deviate from this again. And so then you become almost a caricature of yourself. I was going to say, before we do ADHD moment of the week, I just wanted to ask your last question, James. I just wanted to ask, because I know you wrote about living with your nana or your grandma, whatever you call her, um, yeah. like in the past year. And I was wondering... How kind of, what was the impact of that? Do you feel like things slow down in your brain a bit? Because I know when I hang out with my 97-year-old grandma and Nana, like I, it's a very different space to be in because there's less stimulation, things slow down, but it's actually really peaceful and restful spending time with her. And I just wondered how caring for her kind of influenced you. Um, I, I can relate to that in some ways. So it, you going to my grandmother's house, it, things did used to slow down in many ways it did feel like a sanctuary mm. from the world um and you know there's less stimulation because you know my gram doesn't use the internet there's there's not um that constant yeah exactly so, my, so nan, my nana's is, not boring it's just, just yeah there's just less kind of going yeah. on in the orbit yeah yeah but but i was there for a year during lockdown and in many ways that was harder though because uh she's 92 now and uh her her memory is not not what it was mm. so I'm having to remember for two people um, and she like sometimes with the stimulation. So she's asking me a lot of questions throughout the day, which is, mm. you know, that's, that's fine. Um, but sometimes that can be overwhelming when I'm also trying to, uh, it's just another thing to juggle basically. Yeah. And um, because I was still working at the same time. Yeah. And so that can be, you know, if I'm just in my thoughts, trying to arrange them mm. and she, she keeps asking me like the same question. It's uh, I have to, be pay, very patient and try and uh, it can be hard frustrating to deal with and quite hard um because it throws me off and throws my thoughts sideways so that 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 was a challenge basically yeah I, I relate to that because I feel like I relate to my grandma in a lot of ways because I remember a couple of years ago she rang me and she was really upset because she was like oh I've forgotten all my underwear for this trip and she was like oh I think my memory's going and that week I'd gone away for the weekend and I'd literally forgotten like my whole toiletry bag this is before I knew I had ADHD and I was like don't worry about it Nana like I forget everything too I just did this and we were laughing but then now I'm like oh that's because I have ADHD I sort of have the mind of like a 94 year old and like, it just, I just love, I mean, it's not funny, but the idea of you being with your Nana and having to sort of remember for two people while you have executive yeah. dysfunction and literally can't remember anything sounds quite chaotic. <laughs> yeah. And she, and she, cause she would say like, oh, I go into a room and she's like, oh, my memory is getting bad. I go into a room and forget why I went there. And I'm like, don't worry. I do that all yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So now we're on to ADHD moment of the week. Um, so I have one, Ellie has one, and James also has one. So I'll go first um, and we'll see if this actually happens. So my friend posted last week, well, actually not last week, two days ago, on his story, a friend from school, that he was selling these British short hair cats. So they're the cute grey ones with the round faces. They look like cartoon characters. And I've never liked cats. I've never had a desire to own a cat. But the second I saw that, my ADHD said, you have to buy that. So I spent like the last three days, like convincing my housemate, like convincing the landlord, like convincing the agency, going through my tenancy agreement, finding clauses I could use, talking to neighbors, researching the cats, like hyper-focusing on this thing that I didn't need or want four days ago. Landlord said, yes. Housemate said, yes. <laughs> now I'm just going to just gonna get the money basically. And so I, maybe next week you might hear it meow in the background and that'll be the cat. So we're thinking of names. I don't know why, but yesterday we were watching TV and I, 
I wanted to name him Mr. Cumbersnatch. I don't know if that's even appropriate to say out loud, but I always was, I used to laugh at Benedict Cumberbatch's name. So there was a meme where they called him Mr. Benefric Cumbersnatch or whatever. Live him out. So we're thinking of names, but that's my moment of the week, buying another, a living animal. <sighs> yeah, for no reason. That's me. I hope you sustain interest in it Thank though, because you. you know, kittens for life, not just for... No, dogs are for life. <laughs> kittens are for resale. I'm joking. Um, no, I, I definitely won't. I definitely won't. Like, you won't. Timmy was a cat. What cat? No, I'll definitely. I think I, I love animals. And I think I know that if I get it, I will definitely take care of it. I'm going to sit down and do a deep thing yeah. today before I okay. make the purchase. I am excited to come to come meet it. <laughs> we'll but see. I just worry about this little, little cat. I haven't told my family yet because my mum would be like, you're not buying a cat. She hates cats. She thinks they're demonic. It's a Nigerian thing. Like, all Nigerian oh. women specifically hate cats. So I don't know how it's going to fare well with of like, my mum ever seeing me again, but Does we'll it... see. <laughs> yeah, like superstition, like a lot of witches and stories have cats yeah. and cats that are used as messengers yeah. and travel, like, especially specifically black cats. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a whole, I think it's a thing for a lot of, a lot of um, uh, cultures, but Nigerians like do not, don't ever right. cats. Because as a witch, I love cats. So it will be like you're familiar, but we'll see. Yeah, well, <laughs> don't tell my mum you're a witch because she will lose it. Um, okay, I nothing that interesting happened to me this week, so I thought I'd tell a story that happened when I lived with my auntie. And she... Um, so I lived with mm. her after uni for a bit in London while I was try- trying to find a job. And she's, like, super organised person. She, like, works in HR. So we're, like, the opposite. Um, and having me there, like, she was so lovely to have me there, but also I just, like, got on her nerves because I'd, like, forget my keys all the time. I was, like, being messy. And, yeah, it wasn't great. But there was this one weekend where she went away, and she's, like, very um, – quite Catholic, as are my Irish family. And she goes on this, like, pilgrimage every year where they carry this big, like, wooden crucifix. Sorry, I don't know why I'm laughing. Um, I find it quite funny. <laughs> it's, like, by all means, go on a nice hike. But, like, you don't need to take the wooden crucifix. Like, give yourself a break. It's, like, enormous. It's, like, three people have to carry it at once. And they're, like – constantly like falling over with it like into little like puddles and stuff across the mountains in Scotland anyway <laughs> yeah I'm I was gonna go one year and then I was like you know what? um I don't want to sort of be told I don't know you know what I mean with a bunch of Catholics who probably have different views to me anyway mm. so she was away carrying this cross across the mountains and I invited a couple of people over like my sister and a couple of friends for dinner and obviously classic me like I hadn't done the washing up and I was like all of this shit and I thought to myself okay do you know what I'm just gonna put it in the oven before they get here so I just like chucked it all in there they were like bowls pots pans whatever um <clears throat> closed the oven tidied up the rest of the place looked fine everyone came over was gonna make pizza for everyone put the oven on we're all outside like chatting and suddenly there's just this smell that I've like never smelt before and we like run inside and it's just like all of this steam is coming out the oven and we open it and pretty much everything I put in there was okay because it was like ceramic or you know metal but basically you know those old-fashioned like weighing scales where you have like the little pot that you put on the top of the weighing scale kind of thing like for some reason I'd use that for mm-hmm. something and I'd put it in there and it had like melted onto the bottom of the oven and it honestly smelled horrific. I had like bitumen like burnt plastic and the whole thing oh. was just burnt onto the bottom of it. And it was just so awful and then we had to order pizza and then I spent the rest of the weekend trying to find techniques of like how to scrape it off. And the answer to that actually is if you get tin foil and you put it over the top of the plastic and then heat the oven slowly, the plastic like comes off onto the tin foil. But I found this out after like lots of, of googling wow. but then obviously that triggered my ocd for ages because i was like i'm gonna give her cancer because i've put like there's gonna be like plastic particles in her oven if if that's true please oh, don't no. tell us and don't message me because i don't want to know but yeah that was that old story <laughs> of the oven story so yeah and that basically is just about forgetfulness again and inability to be tidy and james i think you were just talking about forgetfulness <laughs> um as well yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so my ADHD things manifest in my ADHD manifests in lots of small forgetful things. I haven't done anything catastrophic for <laughs> a while, um, but so yeah, I actually was thinking just last week on Friday, I was supposed to be staying with my girlfriend in the Clermont Hotel in Central London, and I went to the wrong hotel. <laughs> uh, we had we had to meet there at the set time because because we had because uh, we had a, a restaurant booked for like. <laughs> eight o'clock and so I had to meet at the hotel like on the dot at, at like 7 30 and I went to the to the Goring hotel instead um and then I was like 
uh, um, we have a booking room like two, three, one. And then they went through a thing and they're like, there's no room two, three, one here. <laughs> Um, and there's no one here but with a book in in that name. And I, it felt like I was in like some weird like Kafka film or something. Yeah. Like what someone's like, what's going on? Mm. They're just like bullshitting me. Um, and then I looked at the phone. I was about to like angrily call my girlfriend saying like, like what's going on? Mm-hmm. Like, there's no booking. And then I just looked at the text where I'd asked her an hour before which hotel. And it's like the Clermont Hotel. It's like, <laughs> why am I even in this? Why am I in this place? Like, did you apologise or did you just walk um, up with I'm, the head down? I mean, I was, I was polite to everyone. It's just inside, internally, I was just like, what the hell is going on? So um, I was just like, yeah, I was I was quite embarrassed. I was like, oh, sorry, I've, I've got the uh, I've got the wrong hotel. Yeah. And they're like completely um, different names. It was embarrassing. They don't even begin with well, the same letter. I was yeah. like, dude. Doesn't even make sense. It, fortunately, it wasn't that far away. It was like a 10 minute walk That's away. That's right. Um, so it was fine. But I was That's worried good. that I was the wrong side of London. Yeah. Bless you. Uh, it's just carelessness like that. <laughs> but at least you remembered you had a plan. I often will be like in bed, like on my phone, and my friends are like, where are you? And I'm like, what the hell, what do you yeah. mean? And they're like, dinner that we're having that started 20 minutes ago. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like rush, get a taxi. I'm on my way, I'm on my way. Like, so God. ADHD brains, but it's always fun talking to other people that do the same things that I do because I feel less bad. So I'm glad you've been to the wrong hotel or whatever. Don't worry, I've done it Yeah, it's frustrating because we'll sometimes you can have, like I had everything else planned out fine. So I was, I'd left my house, I'd, I'd packed my stuff, I'd left my house on time. Um, everything, like I'd, I'd left my house with time to spare. And then there's just one detail, you just get completely wrong. That one minor uh, detail which of which hotel it is you're meant yeah. to be going to. You didn't pay attention to, yeah. But that, yeah, I think um, before we end, I guess, like, we were talking about this last week on the pod. I was having one of those days where, like, everything was going wrong. It was really pissing me off because I'd done everything I could for most of those things to try and either leave on time or, like, pack my bag in advance or message to, to complain, message to, sorry, let people know when I was leaving or just be prepared so that I wouldn't mess up. And then, like, it really annoys me. I think it's the ADHD thing, all irresponsibility. Like, when I'm trying my best to be a high functioning normal lad, I want to take my meds and then things still go wrong. And I, like you said, forget the hotel or, like, yeah. don't take my wallet with me. It's so annoying because it's like, then I beat myself up and I start getting annoyed at myself and I start getting pissed off and I'm angry and I'm in a bad mood and it spirals and then it, the more things go wrong, the more I'm annoyed. And so that's something I'm still trying to work on now is like accepting that I'm going to keep doing things that are going to ruin stuff and it's just annoying and like mm-hmm. coming yeah, to terms Yeah, like not going into self-attack mode uh, too much because yeah, that, that t- can happen as well as a consequence. Yeah, it's like now whenever I book anything, I send screenshots to people because I'm like, is this the right day? Because I've just, oh, we've all done like book train tickets for the wrong day you know just constantly yeah. messing up timings whatever so yeah yeah and, and yeah i went on holiday like a month ago and yeah actually when we initially booked it i initially booked the airbnb for 32 nights <laughs> instead of seven nights um, <laughs> which is james <laughs> james which, okay. uh, <laughs> it would have been really nice but uh, um, it would have been really nice to go that long but it was a bit of a shock when i saw the email come through with the confirmation <laughs> Oh, bless you. Yeah, maybe God. take that L Vance before you start booking this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Ella, do you want to, I guess, round up, say goodbye? Yeah, well, James just thank you so much, James, for coming on there. and for being so candid and open. And it's just been really lovely to hear your story and relate and laugh. And also the fact that I think you're successful in what you do and you love what you do is inspiring. Because I think so much with ADHD, it's like such a struggle to sort of succeed mm. or get anywhere and work and all these things. And I just think it's really nice to talk to somebody who is making it work, you know, and is still doing something that they enjoy. So that's been great. So far, so far. Mm. <laughs> but uh, but thank yeah, thanks. Mm. Thanks and very much for having me onto the podcast. It's been really nice. The chat's been really nice. Um, and it's been been I felt like I can be candid, but that's that's a testament to you guys um, interviewing skills. Oh, thank uh, you. Basically, <laughs> thank you. You're our first guest ever, so we were really we were quite nervous. So thanks for saying yes, and thanks for saying that. Yeah, this has been great. It's been really enjoyable, and I hope I hope people will get something out of it. Thank you. Um, do you want to share your handles or where people can find you and follow you if they want to um, subscribe as we have to your Twitter? Sure. So I'm on Twitter as J underscore Bloodworth. Um, and I'm on Instagram as James Dot Bloodworth, um, so that's straightforward enough. And my book, Hired, uh, Six Months Undercover in Low Wage Britain, is available from pretty much all bookshops. Amazing. Nice. We'll put links below for all the all of the above as well for people to find. So yeah, I mean, 
Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, James, for joining the podcast. And we'll see you guys next week. Goodbye.